on the editorial panel of a quarterly on rational use of antibiotics, acute and chronic diarrhea, he has contributed a chapter on treatment of infectious diarrhea in the Algeria publication, has written an article on management of dry cough in children, which was published in the IJCP. He was also an ex-honorary teacher and pediatric consultant at LTMP Hospital. Now welcoming Dr. Mahesh Mohite on behalf of Sanofi. He, his special interests include pediatric intensive care, neonatal intensive care, teaching PG students, pulmonology and bronchoscopy. He has an overall teaching experience of seven years at the Medical Council of India, Council Member of Indian Academy of Pediatrics Intensive Care Chapter. He was also an ex-president of IAP Raigad Maharashtra, Central IAP Executive Body Member in the year 2018. He was the Secretary of IAP Intensive Care Chapter 2001. He has also been a faculty at many international and national conferences as well. He has contributed chapters to the pediatric intensive care books, published case reports as well. I welcome both of you on board. Uh, I'm sure it will be a worthwhile session. I'll just stop sharing. Yeah. So, Sridhar, sir, you can take over. Yeah, just a minute. So, I, I think I'll, I'll yes. just share my screen. Okay, th thank you so much uh, for that uh, introduction, Anna. And uh, thank you, IAP Raigad. Thank you, Sanofi, for having given me this opportunity. A topic which is something which is very close to my heart. Whether an alteration of the microbiota could prevent allergic disorders. And I think I'm going to modify a little bit of this as I go ahead. Because today, even if you pick up a, a textbook of medicine, it's evolutionary medicine, there is iatrogenic medicine, which has all come to the fore, and microbiology has changed so much. So we today, we don't look at a, an organism in a petri dish, we look at it as a community, whether there is symbiosis, whether there is cohesive synergy, or whether there is pathogenesis. And also the concept of a pathogen, which is changing to how the immune system looks at the pathogen. We call a pathogen more as a perceptogen because you could have a carrier state wherein you could be carrying an organism which could be extremely virulent and necrotizing in one place and could be creating enough trouble at another place. So this was an article yeah. way back in the 2000. This is from the uh, England, New England Journal of Medicine where you could very well see that between 1950 and 2000, there was a drastic fall in conditions like rheumatic fever, measles, mumps, tuberculosis, hepatitis A. And what this basically showed us is the introduction of antibiotics and vaccination, two things that brought down uh, all these diseases. So this was basically probably an effect of the introduction of antibiotics where we basically thought it was an end of an infectious era and vaccination, which we definitely thought was one of the most important things in preventive medicine. But then later on, we started seeing that immune disorders like type one diabetes, allergy like asthma, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's diseases, and all these inf inflammatory bowel disease, they started going up. And we started thinking, was there an association? Was it that there was too much of prevention causing this? And that was the time the hygiene hypothesis came into play. There was so much about the hygiene hypothesis. And we all do know that when we are born, we are born with a TH2 phenotype because you don't want the mother throwing out the baby. So you are born with a TH2 phenotype and then you require a skew to the TH1. So that was the basis for the Strachan's theory, wherein he said too much of hygiene was causing all the diseases that we are seeing today, and that we require the microbiota or the microbiome for immune education. That has changed. That has changed a lot today. We know it's the selective or the microbial loss which is responsible or the encounters with the old uh, organisms that is responsible for the 
the new diseases that we are seeing today. So then came this concept of what is a disease. <clears throat> today we look at disease as an interaction between the host, the exposome and the microbiome. So what is meant by this is, if I take a condition like, <clears throat> say for example, we are entering into an era of pharmacogenomics and we are going to be decoding the host genomics. So if I have my genome decoded and I find myself deficient in that gene, I know that I am not the right candidate to be smoking because I am prone to lung cancer. So that is one way of knowing, yes, because I've decoded my genome, I know my susceptibility, but I need to know my exposome. So if I smoke, I'm exposed to tobacco, I end up with a lung cancer. But that was not the end point. They also saw that only if we have an altered pro-inflammatory microbiome, which was predominated by organisms belonging to proteobacteria in the lung, were you prone to getting this lung cancer. So an interaction between the host genome, the exposome, and the microbiome. Same thing if you take something else like I pick up the BRCA gene on the host genome. I know this lady is prone to lung, uh, breast cancer. I would keep all the exposomes out. That is anything which is hormonal or estrogenic, anything in the axilla which could predispose to it, but it didn't stop there. They did find that when they did an excision of the breast cancer, the microbiome of the breast cancer was totally different from the normal microbiome that you get in a normal breast tissue. So there was, it was definite now that there is an interaction between the host, the exposome and the microbiome. So what is to be learned from this is, we are now trying to see how to curtail a particular disease. So if you can target the host genome, yes, you can do it by the CRISPR technology, but you may require very big scissors and that's going to be a big problem changing or altering the exposome is going to be pretty easy and if you're going to be talking about the microbiome even more easy and why is it that so much of importance is given to the microbiome because when you dissect out a human being he's more of a microbe than a human so the ratio is supposed to be 1.3 microbes for every human cell but in 2016, there was an article which had done a lot of um, statistical and other um, computational study in which they showed that it was almost one is to one. So you have an equal number of microbes to the number of cells in your body. So probably we started thinking that, am I a, a symbiotic organ wherein I have human cells as well as microbes, one is to one. And if I want this being to do well, I need cohesive synergy. So what we actually came to was something called as the hologenomic theory of evolution. Now, what is this hologenomic theory of evolution? We have all heard about Darwinian theory of evolution, which is if you could adapt and if you could adjust well, you do well, be it COVID time, be it family, be it microbes and human cells. So that is Darwinian theory. But if you look at hologenome theory, it basically says that every organism is microbes plus the organism. So you take a plant, plant cells, genome plus the microbiome, animal cell, genome plus the microbiome. Same thing with human beings. And if there is a cohesive synergy between the human microbiome and the host cell, you do extremely well. That's what the hologenomic theory tells you. So what we are trying to come to is, why is it that the microbiome is given so much of importance? Because today we know it's almost the size of the brain. So accidentally you got muted. Sridhar, unmute yourself, please. Sridhar, sir, you're muted. Yeah. So I was yeah. just talking and uh, you couldn't hear anything? 
Yeah. Last, last two minutes. Last two minutes. Last two minutes. Okay. So why is it that we are so much on the microbiome? We are so much on the microbiome for a simple reason that now we know that every human being is made up of an equal number of cells, genome, and an abnormal number of genome. The, the genome is almost 150 to 200 times of the microbes. So the microbial genome is way bigger than the human genome. So if you really dissect out the human being, it's almost 99% microbes. But the new formula says it is almost one is to one, but the genome has got a tremendous role to play. And now we have signature microbiomes. So what are these signature microbiomes? We call them as phenotypes. So you have an allergic phenotype, you have a colic phenotype, so you have different microbial signatures, which could tell you that you could, pre, you could be predisposed to this particular condition. And why are we talking so much about it? Because you have a critical period. And the critical period of development of the microbiota is the first thousand days. But the colic phenotype is the first month. The allergic phenotype is the first three months. So you are getting critical period when you can manipulate the microbiome. And why is it there are aberrations? Because you are moving away from what is normal. So what is normal? In evolution, we have evolved very fast. Compared to the environmental changes, the human body has not kept up with the same speed. That's number one. Number two, we have made changes to such an extent, be it diet, be it exposome, what has happened is we have started missing our microbes or losing our old ancestral microbes, which were extremely beneficial. And we have allowed microbes which were not useful to dominate, what we now call as microbial diversity. So when the diversity goes down, you are allowing the non-important ones to become prominent. It could be pathobionts. It could be something that could promote pathobionts. It could be a group that produces metabolites that could have, that could create aberrations in other systems in the body. And that's what we are going to discuss. Okay, so uh, I, I would basically ask you all to just go through these three excellent articles. They are free access articles. The first one is on infant gut bacterial microbiota and the risk for an allergic disease, which includes asthma. The second one is on human microbiota and asthma. And the last one is specific microbiota changes and the plasma chemokines. So what we are trying to show is, yes, the microbiota is getting an importance today, in the genesis of uh, what is known as allergic disorders. And probably this is not just related to the microbe, it is related to the interaction of the microbe with the human system. And this interaction could be at the genome level or it could be at the metabolite level. And we have found out a number of metabolic signatures which will tell you that this individual at the age of four years or in adulthood is going to get an allergic disorder. Because today we know that allergy is a barrier defect. So when you have an alteration of the barrier, that is when you have the wrong things getting in and there is immune stimulation, you have a TH2 dominance, and you also know that unless and until these epitopes get in, you can't get an allergic reaction. Also the skew, from TH2 to TH1 is, there is a full stop because you're promoting TH2. And the last but not the least, you also know that the, the change from an IgA to an Ig also may depend on the microbiota. So I just thought that let me take this asthma under consideration, and I'm not going to be discussing whether this should be called asthma or asthma. 
because whatever it is, I, I suppose you do understand that this is an umbrella term for an individual with wheezing in the pediatric age group. We usually find triggers that bring about this. In the adults, it is usually what is what was called in olden days as intrinsic asthma. So the root cause still remains elusive. We do know that there is a role for TH2. We do know that there is a role for IL-4, IL-13. There are so many interleukins that have been pinpointed. Now we also know that the, the innate lymphoid cells on the epithelium could bring about a problem. You have an entity called entopy in addition to atopy. But what the bottom line is there is loss of epithelial integrity and there is a hyperreactive immune response. That is why these disorders many years back were called as hyperreactive airways. And what has been proven now is most of these conditions do have a microbial environment which is extremely low in diversity. It is not just low in diversity, there is an abnormal number or the genome seems to be very much different from a normal genome in an individual who's apparently healthy. So we find that the numbers are altered. We find that there is a pathobiont bloom or a bloom of an organism which was not expected. So you have an abnormal bloom. You have an abnormal metabolite profile, which I'll show you later on. But the thing that was almost always consistent was diversity. Tremendous laws of diversity in all these allergic conditions. So when you lose diversity, you allow a few to dominate. And when you allow a few to dominate, you need to understand that an organism can evolve. An organism produces enzymes. So when there is breakdown of food, you may get abnormal epitopes, which may cut across the epithelial barrier and bring about a response. You need to understand that abnormal metabolites from the microbiota can also bring about abnormal changes in the immune system. So that is why we stress upon two things. When a baby is born, what needs to be done before and what needs to be done after? Healthy mother. So what do you mean by a healthy mother? A mother who has no genitourinary complaints, whose oral cavity is absolutely fine. She doesn't get any infection during pregnancy. She doesn't have obesity. Why am I talking about all these things? Because whatever metabolites are produced by her microbiota is going to be transferred to the baby. Even the microbes are transferred. It is no longer considered to be sterile, the womb. And we have picked up organisms in the meconium, in the amniotic fluid, in the placenta. And all these are to prime the baby to the mother's microbial world. So the child is going to be born who's already primed to the mother's microbial world, has got a part immunity, which is all mother, a mitochondrial genome, which is all mother. So here you have a baby who's all mother, who's going to be delivered vaginally so that he picks up gut organisms and the vaginal flora as he comes out. Initially facultative anaerobes that pick up all the oxygen in the gut. And then you supplement with breast milk. And breast milk will see to it that pathogens don't get in. So you have lactoferrin, you have IgA, you have antimicrobial peptides. Initially, you have colostrum, extremely difficult to digest, but it is digested because there is also a proteolytic system in the breast milk. You are bothered about the pH in the stomach of the child, which is around four. You are worried about pepsinogen to pepsin. You need not bother because of the proteolytic system in the baby. So what I'm coming to is, here is a baby born of a healthy mother, delivered normally after labor pains vaginally, smeared with all the fecal and vaginal contents, and is fed breast milk. Don't make the mistake of giving even one dose of a prophylactic antibiotic or one formula feed. 
If you do this, you are pushing this child into dysbiosis. You are pushing this child into later chronic inflammatory conditions. The list is big, right from a metabolic syndrome. And you need to understand this. And the milk has HMOs. We don't talk about HMOs. We talk about everything. We talk about sugar. We talk about fat. We forget the HMOs, a big part of breast milk. It's called the selfish sugar of the mother. The breast milk has all the microbes through her breast milk, almost 200 types, to which the baby has already been exposed. The metabolite has already been, there has been an exposure. The baby has been primed. There is a gradual succession of microbes and the immune education has already started. You have more of a T reg and the T, the tall like receptors are all blunted because of not just the sugars, not just the breast milk, not just the IgA in the breast milk, not just the lactoferrin, but the way everything is done. So there is a beautiful orchestrated way of getting your microbes from the mother. And when you get it this way, you can establish a bifidolactobacillus bloom because the HMOs will promote this. And when you look at the fucosylated, the cialated, that is the acidic and the non-acidic HMOs, and now we know the DSNLT is responsible for prevention of NEC. We know that when the Tregs are not stimulated and you have the TLR4, which is stimulated in excess, by the pro-inflammatory microbiome that you get NEC. We now know that the dysbiosis in infancy is responsible for metabolic syndrome, is responsible for IBD, responsible for atopy, responsible for asthma, and so many other conditions. So the teaching out here is get the mother's milk, deliver vaginally, see that the mother is absolutely healthy, avoid prophylactic antibiotics, Unless and until there is a dire need and you're very sure about it, follow rational antibiotic policy. I wouldn't call any doctor abusing an antibiotic. It is basically because of restricted diagnostics, fear of the, I mean, you don't know, you're so scared, nothing should happen to the baby. Yeah. So fear of the unknown, restricted diagnostics, and easy accessibility of whatever antibiotic you need. So we are not as bad as Europe in prescription of antibiotics, but when you take carbapenems, it's really pretty bad. We are way above even the Europeans because we are scared. So what we are actually ending up is we are doing dysbiosis and we are developing a resistome. Now there is enough awareness being created about resistance but there is no awareness being created about dysbiosis at the gut level, which is related to feeding and related to use of antibiotics. So I, I just changed my uh, lecture into can an altered microbiota cause an allergic disorder? So it comes to the same thing, but it's more, e more easy for you to understand when I talk from this perspective. This is something which I want all of you all to go through. I think the annals, Nestle, uh, the complete uh, 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 educational, uh, this thing from Nestle, which you can get free access in the net is excellent, especially uh, when you talk, think about HMOs. And this particular thing, which is pretty old in 2009 by one of uh, the very senior um, Calio Maki who does so much of work on the microbiota and just see what all has been done. This is way back in 2001. And what they have done here is they have given you what sort of test has been done to show that this is allergy and the culture techniques that they have done. And they have shown the microbiota data as to the signature microbiome, which they have found in these babies. So, if you go through all this, what you get to see is C. difficile very early in life. So in fact, the metabolite that you get from C. difficile is called P. cresol. P. cresol and paracetamol use the same pathway for metabolism. So in a dysbiotic 
less than six months child, when you get paracetamol toxicity, you need to think that today all iatrogenic reactions could be because of the microbiota. So paracetamol is basically metabolized significantly below six months by the sulfation pathway. Picrosol also goes to the sulfation pathway. So if you have excess of C. difficile at one month of age, Picrosol in excess, you know that this child later on is going to develop some form of allergy. Pro-inflammatory. Fortunately, you don't get clostridial infections, that is C. difficile in the first year because you don't have receptors. But when I talk of clostridia, you should also know that there is something called as clostridial 14A clusters, which are immunomodulators. They are a big welcome, whereas the C. difficile is not a big welcome. C. difficile, easily you get it from the hospital. And we do know that the C. difficile is pretty high in babies who are delivered even by C-section. So C. difficile in the first, at the end of first month of life, a lack of bifidobacterium. We do know that bifidobacterium produces a short chain fatty acid called acetate. And this acetate is responsible for barrier integrity. It is also responsible for stimulation of Tregs. So when you have Tregs which are stimulated, you know you bring about balance between Th1 and Th2. And some of the bacteroids that you get very early in life have what is known as a polysaccharide PSA, which is again an epithelial stimulator. And again, it's an immunomodulator. And you don't want a pro-inflammatory organism like Staph aureus or the inflammatory proteobacteria, which, to which E. coli also belongs, Escherichia. All these can create metabolic profiles that can predispose you to a Th2 phenotype. So that's exactly what is shown in all this. But the bottom line is very interesting, which was probably seen in most of these studies, a reduced diversity of the early gut microbiota. Now, what you need to understand that initially it's a developing microbiota. It's chaotic. Find only people who are known are welcome. And when they see people who are foreign, you can either have hyporesponsiveness or hyperresponsiveness. So that's what occurs when you take one dose of an antibiotic or one formula feed. Because based on your formula feed, you bring about your microbiota. And initially you are, there is succession of microbiota. Succession of microbiota, development of the immune system. First three years, you also know it's physiological immaturity of the immune system, it's developing. You also know that the brain is developing in the first three years. There is a lot of overlap between these three things. And you need to understand that in the human body, everything is interconnected. So what has been seen, because I told you that when you take an allergic phenotype, they have found that just like you have a signature microbiota, they have found a lot of signatures in the first 100 days. Lack of acetate, that means bifidobacterium loss, or lack of fecalibacterium violonella lacnospira rotia. What are these organisms? Some produce butrates. Again, 70% of the colonocytes get their energy from butrates. The others are cross feeders. So you can have an acetate, propionate, and butrates, which are considered as short chain fatty acids being changed from one to the other. And they also have a lot of action on panet cells in producing antimicrobial peptides in the IgA switch. And these are common cells which, can, which are extremely beneficial. Or the presence of, so what I have put in the red, a C. difficile in the gut at the end of first month, Morexella, H. influenza, S. pneumonia in the respiratory tract. We do know that when we see a pneumonia, the three organisms, so we are taught in rational antibiotic policy that when you see a pneumonia, use a drug based on what organisms you think of. 
based on the antibiogram and on that particular hospital or region. And these three are very famous organisms linked to respiratory disorders. Porexella, H. influenza, S. pneumoniae. They all go hand in hand. They are co-aggregators and they work as a community. Later at one year, the signature that they have found is FAB de deficient. What I mean by FAB is an absence of fecalibacterium, Acromensia mucinephilia, the mucus eating bacteria, and bacteroids deficient, which also includes the beneficial bacteroids and bifidobacterium, and an excess of candida and rhodotorula. They have seen that fungus is responsible for stimulating the Th2 phenotype through toll like receptors, and there are various other mechanisms. One more mechanism could be through the type 3 innate lymphoid cell in the epithelial lining, which could generate IL-22, or it could be a TH17 pathway. So there is so much to immunity. Let's not break our head on it. But we do know for sure that when you use an antibiotic for a long period of time, you do see that the infant has a red bottom and oral thrush. So you are producing an excess of candida you are creating a dysbiotic state. You're creating a pathobiont bloom, which is extremely obvious. A fantastic study which came in 2016 on which many people have done. There are papers even now in 2020 wherein they picked up the neonatal gut microbiota. And they found out, they studied children at two years and four years, and they found that there was a microbial signature, which showed that if you have this signature, you get atopy at two years and asthma at four years. And what was this? They did find that there are organisms which generate something called as epoxide hydrolase. It's an enzyme that is responsible for breaking down certain PUFA and producing 12-13 die home. Now, this particular compound is a metabolite. Now, if you put in den uh, dendritic cells, that is antigen-presenting cells with the fecal metabolite, you will have a shift towards TH2, a significant shift towards TH2 and an excess of Ig. And they have found out that when you have organisms generating too much of epoxide hydrolase, you develop a significant amount of 12-13 dye home, and this definitely pushes you into an allergic state. And candida and rhodotorella probably work through the same mechanism. And this is still being studied extensively because this hydrolase is also present in humans. Just like today, we know anybody developing excessive atherosclerosis the root cause could be in the gut microbiota. You could have an organism which produces too much of TMA lysis. So phosphatidylcholine in diet, carnitine in diet, the red meat, they are all rich in TMA. And this TMA is liberated by this, hydro, uh, by this lyase and is absorbed, taken to the liver where it is oxygenated. So the TMAO by the flavin system is responsible for accelerated atherosclerosis. So when you have an young person getting atherosclerotic or rapid development of an atherosclerotic disorder, they have started targeting the gut microbes. So you could use antibiotics to knock out these organisms producing TMA lyase, and you could create changes. So this Fujimura study was phenomenal. And you have a number of studies that have followed this based on the same thing. And you need to understand the structure of the intestine before you go any further. See, when you look at the intestine, let's take the small intestine, very thin mucus layer, because this is a place where you have absorption. Then when you look at it, you have the M cells and the Peyer's patch, and you have molecular associated, so pathogen associated molecular patterns, which are picked up. And there is a switch of the B cells into IgA secreting cells. And this is 
really done when you have a lot of common cells. If you don't have common cells and you have pathobionts, you still have an IgA plasma cells, but you have a, a confused pair patch where you can have a switch of B cells producing IgE. I'll go to this a bit later. Then the goblet cell production of mucus is again dependent on common cells. So the MUC2 gene is dependent on common cells. It's a big pathway. I, I won't be discussing that because I've been given only about 45 minutes to talk. Then if you go ahead, you see that at the base of the villi, that is the crypt, you not only have panet cells, but you also have stem cells. So the stimulus for stem cells to produce is again through common cells. The stimulus for panet cells to produce antimicrobial peptides is again common cells. So, and the IL-22 pathway that comes, again, I told you through the innate lymphoid cells, the type three, which is there in the epithelial lining, and the IL-22 TH17 pathways, all these are extremely important. So there is a lot of interplay, provided you have a, a Clostridium 14 cluster, you have a bacteroid PSA secreting, and you have the local common cells stimulating uh, intestinal alkaline phosphatase that breaks down the free LPS from getting into the system. And if you go towards the large intestine, what happens is this mucus layer starts increasing in thickness because you, the, the amount of bacteria also starts increasing. The small intestine is absorption. Large intestine, the motility slows down. The amount of organism is almost 10 raised to 12 to 10 raised to 13 per ml or per gram. So the next time you see a stool report which shows four plus bacteria, don't get excited. Stool by weight is 50% bacteria. So the outer mucus layer keeps away all the microbes from getting into the system. And you have an inner mucus layer. You have beneficial microbes like the Acheromancia mucinophilia, which breaks down mucus, gives, liberates fucose, which is actually a fodder for the common cells, sialic acid, fucose, they're all common cells. They're all fodder for the common cells. So you have something called as nutrient salvage. You have colonization resistance, all provided by your common cells. And the colonocytes get all their energy, almost 70% of their energy, as well as the water absorption in the large intestine is based on what the common cells liberate, that is short chain fatty acid, butrates. So there is so much here that we tend to neglect. Going a little ahead, so colonization resistance, yes, each organism produces a bacteriosin and creates its own niche. So that is barrier integrity. They produce their own metabolites, which have an interplay with the human system. So there is some sort of symbiotic relationship. My system allows them to live there. They provide metabolites to stimulate my system and the metabolites produced don't just work locally, they also have distal effects. Effect on the skin, effect on the lungs, effect on the brain. You have vitamins that are generated, you have folic acid, you have biotin, you have vitamin K. There are so many essential vitamins and there is immune education. Now, if you really see the bile that is formed from cholesterol that comes out, there's primary form with glycine, taurine, and being broken into the secondary forms by the bile hydrolysis. This also is important. It is responsible for lipogenesis and the lipid metabolism. It is also responsible for the immune regulation. And one more thing out here is if you have an excess of secondary bile acids, you end up with Clostridium difficile infection. Segmented filamentous bacteria, normal common cells, TH17, DC dendritic cells, more of a IL-10 production, anti-inflammatory. Stimulation of intestinal alkaline phosphatase, the excess of LPS that is secreted is detoxified so they don't get through the barrier and you don't get a pro-inflammatory state. Secretory IgA secretion, Again, short chain fatty acid. 
acetate, butyrate, propionate, all coming from the oligosaccharides, the non-digestible sugars, and also one more thing which is not there in this site is an amino acid called tryptophan, which is very, milk is very rich in tryptophan. Bananas are very rich in tryptophan. Tryptophan plays a significant role in serotonin generation, in melatonin generation, in indol pathways and Treg system. So you get a tolerogenic DC. And the PSA that I wrote from bacteroids again, Tregs. And all this will keep the pathogens away. So just think of it, one dose of an antibiotic for a boil or a sore throat without an indication has so much of distal effects. So microbes and immune education. Antigen presenting cells, you have the right microbes, they generate IL-10. IL-10 is anti-inflammatory. Gut macrophages can, can phagocytose, can finish off an organism, but they don't act in a hyper-inflammatory state. They are in an allergic state, so they don't generate too much of IL-1, 6, or TNF-alpha. Metabolites like short-chain fatty acids are very essential for TH balance and IgA switch, homing of mast cells to the intestine and not so much to the others. It's again dependent on microbiota education. Commensals, they are pili, the uh, polysaccharide antigen, the outside membrane vesicles, all these are responsible for stimulation of Tregs. Microbes and epithelial barrier, yes, mucus production, dependent on commensals, fucose and sialic moieties that keep the commensals alive and kicking and fine is basically produced from the mucus by other organisms like Acromancia mucinophilia. Today we all know that metformin, a drug that is used for longevity, for metabolic syndrome, works through Acromancia mucinophilia and there is a lot of discussion on that. Tight junctions are maintained by microbes and their metabolites. So this is a very complex system. You have myosin, you have actin, you have rho, you have uh, claudin, zonulin, occludin, so many proteins. All these are dependent on microbial metabolites. So pro versus anti-inflammatory cytokines, this balance again is dependent on microbes. We already, the short chain fatty acid is a separate chapter by itself. Stimulation of antimicrobial peptides from panet cells that flood the mucus, mucus layer is again brought about by the commensal organism. So this is just a repetition. Only thing which I've shown on the right side is what is dysbiosis? Laws of diversity, shifts in metabolic capacity, blooms of pathogens, increase in resistome, and laws of keystone taxa. This you need to understand. And when you use an antibiotic, this is bound to happen. You promote translocation. It's very simple. It's like dropping a bomb. So when you drop a bomb, the organism is going to switch on its virulence genes. The ones which are very quiet also become malignant. That is, it's a very scary situation. They start running helter-skelter. So there is translocation. The immune system is so confused hyperreact or hyporeact. So there is an altered immunity to fungus and virus. Please understand this. For all this, there is enough material to support it. And this is a wonderful article in 2019 in the Immunology Journal on the role of the microbiota in atopy, asthma, and allergy. And I'm going to show you some slides from this article. And I, I think what is needed here is if you have a changing microbe which produces a metabolite profile which is pro-inflammatory, which has an enzyme, I mean, which has a list of enzyme that breaks food in a different form, creates epitopes that can get in and stimulate your immune system. If you have microbes like Sutrella, it's a known organism, which can break down IgA. IgA is needed for immune tolerance. So you have organisms that can break down IgA. You have organisms that get generate histamine, Morganella morganis. Now this Morganella organism is now being studied in COPD patient. 
lot of articles coming in because we know that histamine is something which is very important, not so much just linked to scratching. It is linked to immunity, linked to cognition, linked to wakefulness, and there is so much to histamine than just sleep. And you do know that metabolites can affect cytokines, toll-like receptors, NOD, nuclear factor kappa B that gets into your uh, genome and stimulates the transcriptomics and create all types of inflammatory cytokines. So this is most important slide in my presentation. So when you have dysbiosis, your circulating basophils goes up. The invariant natural killer T cells are also what is known as mucosa associated invariant killer T cells become up, go up. The moment they go up, there is production of IL-13 and 4, which are Th2 promoting cytokines. There is Th2 cell differentiation. There is isotope switching of the B cells from an A to an IgA form. Again, certain chemokine ligands like the CXCL1, which is responsible for, for homing of mast cells to the intestine is reduced. Lot of circulating mast cells and given the opportunity, they get into all the wrong places. You may have it in the skin, you may have it in the lungs, you may end up with an atopy, you may have uh, asthma, and that's the way it is. So dysbiosis results in a chronic inflammatory condition. Inflammatory cytokines go up, co-stimulation, IgA degradation, uncoupling from tissue inflammation. That means some organisms are so smart that they remain there stimulating toll-like receptors, and they still can't be eradicated in spite of all that's happening to eradicate them because they have escape mechanism. The net result is inflammation and a loss of barrier integrity. So you have a loss of barrier integrity, a confused immune system, a Th2 phenotype, IgE switching, and circulating muscles not knowing what to do. You are prone to develop a reactive airway. So what has been studied right from the time the hygiene hypothesis came into existence, that if, you, if your microbial diversity is maintained and your immune stimulation occurs in the right way, what I'm trying to say is precautious immune stimulation. Like suppose I start using all types of probiotics without knowing how they work right from the beginning, it's not the right thing to do. Precautious development also gives rise to autoimmunity. Remember that. Proper animal exposure. In fact, today they say if you have a dog in the house, since it goes all over the place, it's going to bring out, uh, you are going to be exposed to every possible thing. Vaginal delivery is preferred. Breastfeeding, there is no substitute for it. And use your antimicrobials judiciously. And when you look at the lung microbiota, when you have pro-inflammatory microbes, my, my, I mean, uh, Morexella, H influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, viral infections that break barrier integrity and expose you to all um, antigens, increase proteobacteria, which is pro inflammatory, decrease actinobacteria, which is bifidobacterium producing acetate and short chain fatty acids, improving integrity. You know for sure that you are going towards an allergic phenotype. And basically, you also need to know that even corticosteroid resistance is today linked to the microbiota. So if you have an individual who does not respond to corticosteroids, start thinking, is it the microbiota there? In fact, they have found out that if you have a very high level of H influenza in your respiratory tree, the response to corticosteroids is on the lower side. In fact, even the mechanism by which Azithromycin works in a neutrophilic type of asthma is probably by altering the microbiota. So there is so much to the microbiota. And so this is what is being discussed. It should be selective hygiene hypothesis, missing our old friends or the missing microbes, which is responsible for the, the exposure to the old microbes, which is responsible for the allergic epidemic. Thank you so much for a patient hearing. I really feel we need to eat clean and play dirty. Daag acha hota hai.
uh, I'll just take a minute. Shridhar sir, there was a question by Dr. Abha Sahib Patankar as to how to prevent dysbiosis in a situation when we can't avoid antibiotic in a neonate. Exactly. So, so this is a predisposition to dysbiosis, and you know about it. Like, for example, you are trying to be, uh, you are tr trying to treat neonatal sepsis. So, I don't know if you have gone through this article on lactobacillus plantarum plus fructo oligosaccharides. Now, this was a study that was done by Dr. Pinakim, who's an Indian, who picked up about. Uh, I think it's almost more than 4,000 cases in multiple villages in Orissa. And this was done over five to six years. It's not an overnight study. They studied the basic microbiota or what is called as the enterotype in that place. They created a lactobacillus plantarum. They supplemented it with a prebiotic called FOS. And this combination, which is a symbiotic, was used to prevent neonatal sepsis or late neonatal sepsis. And the success rate was so much that the other, they had to stop the study midway because they, are, they were not right in preventing the other limb from not getting it. And this was, I think, funded also by the ICMR. And there are a lot of people standing in line to uh, get this into the market. It is lactobacillus. You could get into nature, type pinakin, lactobacillus plantarum plus FOS, for neonatal sepsis, and you'll get this article. What is important to understand here is, yes, you could use the right organism, what is known as bacteriotherapy. So addition of an organism in the form of a probiotic, addition of a metabolite, what is called as postbiotic, a combination of a pre and a post, prebiotic and a probiotic, what is called as a symbiotic, Prebiotics are now used, you know about it. In prebiotics now, fucosylated uh, HMOs like 2FL, um, DSNLT that is being used for prevention of NEC, LNT. So 2FL and LNT is going to hit the market. DSNLT is going to hit the market to prevent uh, NEC. And uh, uh, FOS and GOS, you have some milk products wherein you can't give breast milk and you are left with no other thing but to give uh, a supplementation wherein you have an added FOS and GOS as a prebiotic because you're trying to salvage the normal microbiota. So you need to use pre, pro, symbiotic, postbiotic, new generation probiotic, designer probiotics, postbiotics. But we are all getting into an era called new generation probiotics where a probiotic is looked as like a drug. So you can be using an acromantia mucinophilia for metabolic syndrome, a fecalibacterium for IBD, wherein you know all about how to give it, the dose, the indications, the interaction, the duration, all the side effects. So it comes in as a drug. So we are moving into an era, but unfortunately today, what we do is we give whatever is available. So I give a cocktail of probiotics thinking it will work, I give something which is lactobacillus. It's, that's not the way to go about it. You require evidence-based therapeutics. So in the prevention of NEC, we know today a combination of lactobacillus with a bifidobacterium is most useful. And it should be started right in the beginning. So when you start with some gavage feeds right in the beginning, you need to know that there is no substitute for breastfeeding. So you need to understand the disease. You need to understand the implications of the collateral damage of the drugs that you are using. So if you take a child in an ICU who is receiving multiple antibiotics, he's using a PPI, he's using an NACID, everything is a prescription for a microbial disaster. Antibiotics knock out the microbiota. PPI knocks out the first line of defense that is the gastric acidity. And also your digestion goes for a six. And NACID is anti-prostaglandin. Prostaglandins are needed for epithelial regeneration. You knock out the prostaglandins and epithelial healing is impaired. So you need to understand that each and everything that you're using is going to be a disaster. Okay. I hope I... 
at least gave you a brief this thing on to uh, how you should go about in prevention of this dysbiosis. Thank you so much for answering that, sir. Uh, there's also a question from Dr. Jay, Bandar, Jay Kumar Bandarkar. Does prematures are more prone to dysbiosis? Yeah, absolutely. You know, they have an absolute immature gut. They have come out through the wrong way. It might have been even before onset of labor. So you have uh, probably it could be a cesarean section. It should be intervention. You have the hospital microbiota that has gotten, which is absolutely pro-inflammatory. So this is a state wherein there are a lot of... Now, you should go into uh, the YouTube videos, which has Underwood and Patel. Type Underwood Patel Prevention of NEC. Excellent presentations. Or Lars Bourdais on HMOs. You will know all about DSNLT from Lars Bourdais. You will know all about the types of probiotics that have been used for prevention of NEC. We all know that there is a bloom of gamma proteobacteria before NEC sets in. And we all know that TLR4 signaling is hyper in all these preterms because they are not exposed to the right microbes. They have not been primed for such a situation and they have been hit by microbes wherein they don't know much about. So there is a hyper responsiveness and the breast milk supportive system also comes in a bit late. Plus, you have multiple other factors. You have a hyper osmolar feed going in. You have bowel ischemia. There is the so-called uh, shunting of blood from non-essential to essential organs. You have multiple drugs going in. You have an umbilical line which is affecting the celiac axis. It's, it's all a mess. That's what I try to tell you. Everything is interconnected, but we know for sure TLR4 hyper to gamma proteobacteria bloom before NEC sets in. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, I missed a question. There is also a question. Any probiotic to enhance microbiota in babies deprived of breast milk? Uh, you, again, you need to understand one more thing. When you use a probiotic in a preterm or a neonate, the chances of translocation is extremely high. So that is why any probiotic that you use in a neonate, sit with the parents, talk to them, because today is safe pediatrics. And I think Eamon Gangolia would be able to answer this question better. So it should be a one-is-to-one -one talk with the parents. And you should know the antibiogram of that particular probiotic. So you use only probiotics that get into the market as drugs. So if I'm going to be using Bacillus clausi, I know that fluoroquinolines work on it. The genome has been decoded. I know it's all about um, Bacillus clausi, enterogermina. I know the genome is decoded. I know quinolones work on it. So what I do is I talk to the parents and in case it translocate, I know a single dose of a quinolone is enough to knock out this particular thing. So you need to have an antibiogram before you do it. Then what is meant by evidence-based therapeutics is you, whenever you use a probiotic, you should have an indication. There should be a study done in your enterotype. Like Indians usually are Prevetella group. We are plant and grain eating groups. So if you take the human genome project and the gene catalog, integrated gene catalog, we are more into the Prevetella group. And a lot of studies have come from Bhopal in Kerala where they have decoded and they have found that since we are more into a Prevetella group, uh, our enterotype is totally different. We may not be able to gel well with many microbes. So you need to be careful. And in, in the era of COVID, where everybody is pointing a finger at China, you need to understand that a microbe is something that evolves as it passes through the gut. So... I am a different person when I'm giving a lecture. I'm different when I'm with my friends. I'm different when I'm with my kid. So in the same way, the evolution of a microbe is going to be totally different. So unless and until you know stability of the microbe, genome of the microbe, antibiogram of the microbe, don't use that particular probiotic. And the last thing is ask them for evidence-based reports. That is studies based on Indian population. We have enough of this, like if we are using Clausi for a gastro, we know we have enough studies on, we have Indian data. 
We also have data wherein there has been an accidental translocation and how it was treated. So we have enough data on that. So you need to have it as a drug. You need to have it with its antibiogram and with its genome decoded. You need to have a repository in a firm. Like for example, they all come with a number. So if you have ATC something, it's an American culture based repository. So in that way, you need to know everything. Okay, thank you so much, sir. And thank you for your questions, Dr. Abbasaib and Dr. Jaikumar. There's a question by Dr. Satish Tahane. It is, is there any follow-up studies in neonatal sepsis, TP, in future life? Any significant problems with dysbiosis or diseases as they receive lots of medication or antibiotics? I, I, I just couldn't uh, hear you properly, Anz. Okay, sir. I'll just repeat. Is one second. Any? Is there any follow-up studies in neonatal sepsis, PTs, I think, point in future life, any significant problem related with dysbiosis or diseases as they receive lots of medication or antibiotics? Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a simple uh, example. So, um, what happened is uh, in the farm animals, to make them fat, a subclinical dose of antibiotics was being used. And they found that the animals started gaining weight. And this has started happening in the pediatric age group. So all those kids who have received antibiotic in the first year of life do develop metabolic syndrome. I mean, do develop obesity. And do you know which antibiotic has been implicated the most? It is azithromycin. So it has been found that if you have received even one course of azithromycin in the first year of life, the chances of you being obese is extremely high because of the dysbiosis that you have created, because your microbiota is developing in the first thousand days and it sets in by thousand days. And if you mess up with the microbiota at that time, you have a microbiota that is more of nutrient salvage and a pro-inflammatory state. So now it's known that antibiotics have distal long-term effects, what is known as antibiotic-induced dysbiosis. And this is linked to almost everything, including malignancies. So you need to be careful. That's number one. Number two, we really don't know. Like, for example, we had a discussion on lactobacillus ruteri, something that is added to formula feeds, something that is used for colic. And the discussion was the colic phenotype changes by four months. So between four and six months, you, you're back to a normal phenotype. So the question is, why do you need to treat with a bug in the first few months if you are going to be normal by the end of six months? The second question is, we do know that it's a community out there, and if you use ruteri, it can have an effect on the other lactobacilli population. It's a known thing. Ruteri works by producing ruterin, which works on the vanilloid receptors and suppresses pain. So now when you have ruteri being used for colic and colic being a self-limiting disorder, you start wondering, are you right in giving ruteri? But the teaching is this genesis of pain or the pain pathways also set in very early. So if you have a pain pathway, which is hyper responsiveness, where there is hyper responsiveness, they have followed with this, these children who have had colic in the first month. And when they have followed them up for almost up to 20 years of age, these are the kids with motion sickness, with migraine, with abdominal, recurrent abdominal pain. So there is a lot of linkage to functional abdominal pain and sensory pathways. So I really don't know. Only time will tell us, yes, there is a role. And I don't know what Ruteri can do and whether it will be beneficial or whether it will be detrimental. When I did ask this question to a very senior microbiota specialist, even she was lost and she told me even she doesn't know the long-term implication that only time will tell. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Jayakumar Pandarkar is saying excellent session. Dr. Rajendra Chandorkar is asking, so many, so many hypothetical indications of using pre-probiotics, which are the indications proved beyond doubt world over? 
uh, this this is an evolving science. Okay, so the microbiota. If you pick up your textbook of uh, pediatrics, Nelson, it's only in the last four years you have a chapter there on the microbiota. We were all germophobic, and we are again germophobic after the COVID era. But now we know that the first line of defense is the microbes. So we are now moving into an era of new generation probiotics. If you really ask me, the places where we do use a probiotic is where we feel it definitely has a beneficial effect. So we, we have been using Ruteri and Lactobacillus GG, and there is one more cocktail of probiotics in infantile colic, functional GI disorders. We are using uh, a lot of probiotics in the prevention of antibiotic-associated dysbiosis. Uh, I would, in, under which category you have antibiotic associated diarrhea, that's number two. Viral gastroenteritis is again another place where we do know that if you want to shorten the duration, you need to give it pretty early and there are beneficial effects. Uh, that's another thing. Then one more condition where we are using um, a probiotic is allergic disorders. So in the prevention of atopy, in the prevention of allergy, a lot of probiotics are being used. But again, some of these studies are so skewed and these studies are done in such a funny way that we are very apprehensive. So what I mean by apprehensive is, I'll give you an example. If I tell you that I'm running a daycare center where I have 10 children, out of which five developed loose motion. And... Um, I decided that from the next month, I'm going to give them a probiotic X. And when I started giving all of them probiotic X, the incidence came down by 50%. So, uh, so from suppose I had 12 babies first, and now only six developed loose motions, I'm going to say that there is about 50% reduction in the incidence of loose motion. But you need to read in between the lines. What is in between the lines? You need to know that there are a lot of things that affect loose motion. So initially there was only one maid or ayabai who was taking care of the kids. In the second month, you had one ayabai for every two kids. Initially it was food cooked in the premises. Now it is food got from home. Initially it was water from the aqua guard in the institution. Now it's bottled water, which is uh, one of those uh, bislary types, which parents get it for every child. So these are variables that have to be taken into consideration when you make a study and you go more into confidence interval, CI, rather than just because statistics is something which is extremely pliable. The more facts, the better you sell. So you need to read everything with a big, big pound of salt, not a pinch of salt. And you need to have really evidence-based therapeutics. So if I manufacture a paracetamol, I need to show that my paracetamol does everything that is given in Goodman, Gilman, or Satoshka. So I need to do those therapeutics. Same way with every probiotic in the market. So before they sell it as a product, not as a food product, as a product, they need to show this. And today the biggest care is all those added microbes to the dahi, to the milk, and all the food items because we don't know the resistance pattern that they carry. And they may really make a mess out of our uh, resisto. Thank you, sir. Uh, there was this one last question from Dr. Jay Kumar. It was, what are the other causes of dysbiosis other than antibiotics? Yeah, so we usually call it as the Ds. So when you take the Ds, the first is diet, the wrong diet. Two is drugs, any prescription. So if I take a respiratory disorder, even a nebulizer is going to cause a problem. The ipratropium affects gut motility. The salbutamol affects potassium and affects gut motility. The cough mixture has antihistamines, first generation, which are anticholinergic, gut motility, and NSAID, epithelial regeneration, an antibiotic, be it a macrolide, or be it a beta-lactam, the microbiota. So diet, westernized diet, two drugs, three is disease, and the last is distance. So disease is any illness. Suppose I get a strep throat. 
I'm going to be treating the throat, that antibiotic is going to affect my gut. Because I've got a bad throat, I'm not going to be eating. I'm going to be eating. My diet is going to totally change because of the pain and the sickness. And the stress, the hypo, there is something called as the gut brain, the gut lung, and the gut skin, and there are so many axes. Everything is linked. For example, if you take the liver, which is the biggest site where all gut metabolites go, the liver produces almost 500 hepatokines. It has a connectivity with almost every organ in the body. And we tend to neglect. In fact, a dropping platelet. How many of us have thought of a chronic liver disease? Thrombopoietin comes from the liver. So these are small things which we need to understand. And this is something I feel uh, we need to give a lot of importance. And last D is distance, traveling. So when you're traveling, your diet changes. Your sleep is affected. Remember, even the gut microbiota have a biological rhythm or a circadian rhythm. And that is why if you eat food in the middle of the night, I just saw Mahesh eating a dinner pretty late. Now this is going to cause indigestion because the microbes also tend to sleep. Their activity is also pretty low and you, they produce the wrong metabolites and you end up with an upset tummy. Vidhar, can I ask you one question? Yeah. Uh, the longevity, expected life, when uh, independence came to India was somewhere around 40, 45 years, below 50. Today we are almost 80 years. Right And world over, the longevity has increased over the years, thanks to the modern medicine. If every medicine is going to cause dysbiosis and harm to the body, how do you explain that the longevity is increased in no, spite so, of all so, the medicine? So that is why everything is interconnected. We are not talking about longevity. We are talking about quality. Okay, so you definitely say with the longevity, longevity quality has quality. changed. Longevity has changed with antibiotics. Longevity has changed with vaccination. Longevity has changed with your ICU care. Fine, but the quality, if you are in a chronic inflammatory state, Alzheimer, the incidence is very high. Parkinson's, every third person you meet, senior citizen is a, having a problem like Alzheimer or Parkinson's. Now, you, what you require is not just quantity, you require quality. So we do know that when you talk about Parkinson's and the Lewy bodies, it is from the gut because first they get constipation. It's a known thing, fecal transplant is being tried out. Alzheimer's, you know beta amyloid, you know it's sleep, and also you know it is from the gut, you know serotonin, so many receptors. So you are right, but longevity also depends on the telomeres, the length of the telomeres. And there, it's an interplay of many other things other than microbial metabolites. See, all the diseases which you mentioned, they come at a later part of your life. Absolutely. So you have to survive to go to that later part. Previously, people were, see, one of the reasons people, like we used to say in India, we don't have chronic lung disease in premature babies and US and UK has high because they were saving those six, 700 gram babies. We are never saving. Now that we started saving them, we are also seeing the higher number. So because with the longevity increased, all these diseases increased. They were there in prior. Those people who survived beyond 60, 70 in olden days also might have had it. We don't have that statistics. So. Uh, I, I agree that you are creating with every intervention, you are disturbing the nature to summarize everything will be with every intervention that you make, you definitely disturb the nature. But is the summary also so that we should stop all the interventions? No, I'm not telling different. you about interventions. I'm just telling you that the next time you pen, think of collateral damage and do okay. something so that you don't create that problem. So we are trying to find out something by which that is, see, in some conditions, you don't know who came first, the egg or the chicken. So when you find, like for example, IBD, there was so much of discussion that when you have an inflamed gut, you have a lot of reactive oxygen. So when you have a reactive oxygen, you are bound to get facultative anaerobes. You won't get strict anaerobes. So we were thinking whether it is, well, who came first? Uh, so that's true. So what I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to say everything is microbiota. I'm not trying to sell that microbiota concept. But what I'm trying to say is we are getting into an era wherein we only think of stem cells to save lives, to increase longevity. But now it could be fecal transplant. So you may store your feces in the first year of life in a bank, which could be used later on to improve the quality of your life. Because like Hippocrates said, everything begins in the gut. 
and ends in the gut. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right, Thank I'll you for the that Longevity part as to whether the microbes have something to do with it. Because just, there is so much on the telomere and I'll get back to you. Just a last Definitely. comment on this. That unfortunately, why this irrationality and overuse of antibiotics, one single reason. You spoke about so much of research on genomics and everybody may after maybe 20, 30 years will be born instead of having his birth certificate, he will be having a genomic certificate and saying that he is okay with this drug and not okay. On one end, the research is going to that end. And the other end, even a sick baby, I cannot with 100% assurance say that he is not having a bacterial infection. There is no, even the blood culture yield today is 30%. You send six samples, the yield in a bacterial endocarditis maybe say 90%. Problem is the detection rate. You get a PCR positive, many times it's multi, multi organisms in road, whether it's a causative organ. That's a limitation. The research, whether it is going only in one direction to the extreme and the other is not. The practical part is if tomorrow a research tells me that yes, this baby has this bacteria inside or this baby definitely don't have bacteria, has only virus. If you come with that kind of authenticity, then obviously the, I mean, no practitioner gives antibiotic because he is fond of it. It's only because he's scared that he may be losing if I don't, especially a premature baby or an infected baby. If I don't do it in the next six to eight hours, I may see a baby which is on the no return path. So that's a problem. So I understand absolutely. what you said is absolutely phenomenal. I always admire your memory, Sridhar. I don't know how you remember those long names. I, I have, uh, I could not remember a single one and I will not try. But I, I suppose both of us are of the same age, but uh, you are gifted with some different, uh, whatever. Yes, on, I, I, I want to ask you, I want to ask you which of the probiotics you would tell me, I will also start eating from today. Well, I, 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 always just, I just that. wanted to add on one <laughs> last thing. One last thing. That, uh, yeah, when, when you talk about uh, limitations and why, why is there so much, I, that's why I never call it an abuse. I call it misuse. Because of diagnostic limitation Absolutely. and easy accessibility and fear of the unknown. Simple as that. Absolutely. So you don't want to, you, you prefer erring on the wrong side. It's okay. It's fine. You think you can come out of it. But sustaining that is a problem. So if I'm in a remote area where it's all clinical and, don't, and I don't have diagnosis on a chip, I'm going to be in a mess. And the teaching is, why wait for a third generation antibiotic? Why play with the first generation, create a mess and then get to the third one? Go straight to the third one. That's how you're even taught by company people, which is ridiculous. But mm -hmm. we don't have local antibiograms everywhere. And it keeps changing. And we need to have more of interactive sessions. So if you have more of interactive sessions, the new generation, which is so well read, will understand that just reading is not enough. Just like our teacher Amdekar teaches us, that when you open a textbook, you start with a diagnosis. But here the problem is coming to a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yes, Dr. Sridhar, it's really a pleasure to listen you every time. And I do agree uh, the very varied points raised by Mahesh Moite. Your first slide was the infection rate is gradually, uh, I mean, incidence of infection is gradually going down. It is because of antibiotics which we use. <coughs> we cannot say that every antibiotic we use is irrational use of antibiotic. But suppose we stop using antibiotic because of fear of this, all these things. Probably this infection again will increase. So whether oh. every antibiotic should be used. Hey, you have got me wrong. I'm not saying that stop using antibiotics. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is it is, that is why when I, when I talk about the sore throat, I can teach you how every antibiotic is effective. But if I now discuss that, I'll be entering into Mahesh's time space. <laughs> so right from a cefpodoxime, which is the drug of choice, I could show you. If I take microbiota, cefpodoxime becomes a drug of choice and not penicillin. But cefpodoxime causes ESBL. Penicillin takes 10 days for eradication. You don't get penicillin in the market. The compliance is almost zero. And penicillin will promote uh, organisms that re cause recurrence of uh, streptococci. So there is so much. There is an alpha and gamma hemolytic streptococci that promote, that prevent reinfection. So penicillin eradicates that also. Whereas cefpodoxime will not eradicate. So the teaching is not used. Cefpodoxime, what I'm trying to teach is every treatment has a limitation. 
make a diagnosis, understand the diagnosis before you write your prescription. And when you write a prescription, know the front, the back, and the inside of every drug you write. And if a drug fails, it could be the microbiota. Chloramphenicol toxicity is microbiota. Digoxin is microbiota. Even anti-cancer drugs like irinotecan is microbiota. Paracetamol toxicity in first six months is microbiota. So there is so much to it. So what I'm, I'm just creating an awareness that the next time you write a prescription, think. Just don't write. So we have a tendency, ek monosef lik diya, uske piche ek la, falsigo lik diya, uske piche aur ek lik diya. No, don't do that. Give it a thought. When in doubt, you can take a second opinion also. And if you have a screening body in your hospital, you are inhibited from misusing. Okay. Uh, so, Mohitesh's presentation is pending. So, I before that, I just would like to in, uh, welcome Dr. Sunita Ingre, the president of IAP Raigad. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining in and for your help as well, for the coordination and all. Uh, I welcome Dr. Chitra Kulkarni as well. She was there in the beginning of the session, VP of IAP Raigad, as well as Dr. Nilima Bhandarkar, the secretary of IAP Raigad. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Mohitesh, sir, you can go on with your presentation. Sir, can you stop sharing? Yes, sir. How much time do I have, by the way? Uh, so you can start, I mean, till 11 o'clock. The meeting was scheduled till 11 o'clock. We can go past we already, that. We are already at 11, 9, what? 9.30 or 10.30. We are already 9.30. 10 10 yes. Do you have time at all? One second. Uh, I'll just confirm and yeah. I'll tell you. Yes, so one second. My sir. Yeah. 30 minutes. <laughs> What I will take, maybe take one or two cases, and I want three, four people to discuss the cases. Three, four people should volunteer. So maybe Abha, Jay, Sunil, Raja, chalo ho jao. Sure, sir. Sure, sure, on sir. Karo. sure, sir. All of you join, and you will discuss the cases. That will be much better rather than making a monologue. So all four, five, even Sagar, if he's here. So just join the case so that we can discuss it. That will be better. Abha, Sunil, Raja, Sagar, are you there? There, sir. There, sir. So, so first caveat, the cases are respiratory to start with, but they may turn out to be something else. Let right. me think that I will go with that and make the slide wise present. Who else is there? Sunil is there. Raja is there. Anybody, anybody. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. No problem. But you can interact. Make your audios uh, heard. Okay. So, the first case is a two year old. He was brought for fever since 15 days, cough since 10 days, failure to thrive, frequent respiratory complaints and visits to doctor since last more than a year. So basically this is the two year old, came with 15 days fever history and cough since 10 days and he is a case with a recurrent respiratory complaint visiting almost every 15 days to the practitioner. He is born non consanguineous first child of the couple, birth weight 2.8 kg, no significant perinatal, antenatal, intranatal history. Now, Ah, the past history which is relevant, he has visited pediatrician almost every 15 days since age of 8 months and needed admission 4 times for respiratory complaints so far. First admission at 7 months of age. He also has a history of Cox contact. An elderly neighbor where a child is taken frequently is a, a chronic patient on irregular treatment. We don't know whether it is MDR or uh, say, uh, this thing, it's a sensitive to primary type. On examination, his vitals, is hemodynamically stable, slightly tachycardic 120, his capillary feel is okay, limbs are warm, he's a bit febrile, conscious, irritable, oriented, his mild tachypnic, as I said, he's got subcostal, intracostal interactions, no stridor, no wheeze, granted. This is his anthropometry. He's got 7.8 kg child, centimeter, it's two years, mind you, 7.8 kg. 70 centimeters, mean uh, uh, midam circumference is 12 and head circumference is 48. General examination, there is no cyanosis, saturation 92%, no lymphadenopathy, no rash pigmentation, no other positive findings. His RR is increased, his tachypnic on examination respiratory system, he, as I said, he has got retractions. The flat left hemithorite with a decreased movements. 
Apex is the properly placed left fifth intercostal space metaclavicular line. On percussion, there is no significant differential uh, difference appreciated on two sides. On auscultation, the decreased air entry left hemithorax, few scattered crepts, increased vocal resonance in the retrocardiac region, and right side is normal. And his rest of the systems are all right. Now, somebody want to make any interpretation out of it? Two-year-old child, 15 days history fever, cough, he's sick from eight months age, recurrent visits. His previous, his previous yeah. admissions four times, what, hmm. for what reason? Respiratory infections. All and all recovered. I mean, my, I mean, respiratory complaints, all along respiratory complaints. And he was quite normal in between? Uh, now, he has been having some respiratory complaints off and on cough and all, but requiring admission four times. Otherwise, in between mm -hmm. and almost, almost two weeks, almost every 15 days he was visiting the doctor. He has got immunity problem. Immune deficiency, we must think of at the first uh, important factor. Of, Raja, what kind of immune deficiency? I don't know. We will have to investigate and think no, no, over because it. Simply, why, my, my bet to that is basically since it is only respiratory infection all along, if it is immunodeficiency, I will see it multi-systemic, usually, okay. especially one coming at that age, something coming manifesting at, so something coming after six months, usually uh, uh, humoral immunity, if it comes right at birth, then it's T-cell, like skid and all, but okay. coming late will be more of humoral immunity, and then if it is time and again, only respiratory, no other system, mm. I will keep immunity lower down, okay. that's what will be a take on that. Okay. Anybody for a cox in this child? No. Sir, immunized no. status... Sir, Mohita, sir. Uh, he's he's a uh, universal uh, immunization program. He has gone or got all the vaccines. Sir, is, recurrent uh, aspiration or uh, congenital anomaly, some. Okay. Okay. So we'll take that being the respiratory. He, he so, has got a flattening of the chest, left yes. side. Yes. So there is a volume loss. Yes. Right, on left side. But yes. at the same time, there is an apex which is there in the left fifth intercostal space. Yes. So it may be something which is happening again and again, but started at eight months of age. This is an X-ray or admission. Prior to that, the previous slide showing counts which are on bacterial, urine, lung, uh, liver function, kidney function, normal, and this is an X-ray. So somebody want to take on the X-ray? Neither is an X-ray master, by the way. So Sridhar will be commenting later. Somebody else from Raigad takes it first. And then Sridhar will come along. Bolo, bolo. Sridhar, you want to comment? So, so if you look at this X-ray, what is very obvious is uh, there is a definite shift. Because yeah. usually, uh, no, there is a definite shift. There is an air bronchogram that is seen on the left side, there is also a plural lamellar plural line or a plural reaction that you can make out on the left side. Hmm. Uh, the thing is, uh, the why is the, the right lung so hyperinflated and herniating to the, to the left side? So it, usually when there is compensatory hyperinflation, you don't get so much of a herniation to the other side. So there is a herniation on this side. Okay. There is a structure which is dilated, which is on the left side of the spine, uh -huh. uh, which is like a esophagus, but esophagus usually is a collapsed structure and will uh -huh. not show air type of a thing. Which is, and the trachea which is there, which is deviated a little bit, maybe because of uh, deviated film of the spine might have moved. But what is that which is there seen as a dilated esophagus type of a thing? It okay. can be achalasia cardia. Okay. It is dilated esophagus recurrent aspiration is another. Shall we move ahead? Yeah, so yes. there is just one thing which I wanted to stress on is when you don't have centralization, we don't talk about the difference in the uh, uh, hyperlucency and uh, because this, you need to understand that this is not at all, it's a totally rotated plate that has to be kept into consideration. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, uh, you made few comment that herniation of the lung again that will be depending upon the centralization. Once you don't have centralization, you may not call it as herniation. If you see the clinical finding, there was a flat chest collapse. So collapse cooling hole media stand to the left can explain everything. And then the other lung, which is because diaphragm is also not flat, unlike the pressure, uh, you know, pressure lung hyperlink. So it's more of a compensatory emphysema, which you're seeing on the right side. That, that's how I will get into that. Can I'll, we I'll go ahead. Body, sir? Now, this is almost uh, 10 months history. No, obviously that time nobody choked, uh, saw the choking and all. But fine, we can keep that as a differential right. diagnosis in this case. Can we just see yeah. that x-ray once more? Sure. Can you show us the x-ray once more? This is the x-ray. Can you see that? I have displayed. Is there? Hypoplastic left uh, lung. So you mean to say agenesis? But I got a bronco uh, increase VR on the left side. Right. But and there the are crepes. Air entry is there. Any lateral loss taken? Ahead? Any lateral loss taken? No. Okay. No, at this point I didn't have. I didn't take. Scan. We discuss this. What you wanted CT scan? I am coming to that. So he was sent to us from a center, uh, from a other center from Mumbai. His gastric lavage was done by the referring unit prior to coming to me, which was negative. His tracheal aspirate was done since he was having this chronic collapsing kind of a thing. And the CV night was done, which was TB was weak positive, which was rifampicin sensitive. So he was already on AKT for last two months without any clinical response. And child was suggested CT thorax for any lymph nodes or missed anomaly. And this was a CT plate. I have just taken one cut which was found relevant. So it was showing a, again a collapse consolidation kind of a pattern with probably underlying patent bronchus. That's what was giving me increased VR. Now what next? Actually, this child was sent to me for uh, getting a bronchial lavage and uh, because a treating physician got uh, tracheal aspirate, which was positive for uh, gene expert, but he was not very happy with that. Said, give me a bronchial lavage and proper. But the whole history was hinting somewhere. This child has been sick since eight months, was never all right. If you see the anthropometry at two years, he was having an anthropometry of a nine months baby. So some disease, which is chronic persistent, and without TKT, if had it been a Cox for last one year, it would have been very bad. So this child is not. So it's something which is chronic persistent disease, or maybe with recurrent exacerbations in between. Even we thought of some kind of aspiration syndromes coming from. Any foreign body aspiration? Uh... No, I mean, see, the mother could not recall one and a half years back history, but no obvious foreign body. No, no yeah. obvious choking history. In this Bronchoscopy will help. Yeah, we did the bronchoscopy. And you can pick up. There was a H type TO fistula in this child. You can see that. I think yes, you yes. can make it out. This is a H type. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So basically, this child has been taking treatment as pneumonia, Cox, and everything. But history was never like Cox, basically. It's a chronic, persisting, more than one and a half years history. Without a treatment, child won't have survived for this long. And then he was chronic recurrent aspiration. As, as Raja said, immunodeficiency. Yeah, well, but had it been a general yeah, immunodeficiency, it would have been multi-system. So what was this? Yes, what was this? History of persistent abdominal fullness and poor uterus since the beginning overlook. Now, this was a poor uterus and persistent abdominal fullness was there. And what, Ra, what, what Abba pointed out is absolutely fantastic. This is a dilated eosophagus and dilated eosophagus, one of the closest or rather very few differential diagnosis is some leak from the lungs into the eosophagus. And this is kind of an indirect marker of H type TO fistula. You, you get this kind of a presentation with connection between the trachea or lung under this. So in fact, this was totally missed by all the previous uh, people treating. And this itself could have given you enough. In olden days, people would have diagnosed this. Of late, we don't see the X-ray so carefully. So this dilated esophagus is, is the pointer. In fact, I presented this in one of the uh, uh, SRCC meets. 
and uh, radiologist Hiren Panwala picked up this and he gave that differential diagnosis. This could be H type fistula, and it was absolutely wonderful. So, so this was so, a, a, yeah. So what would be the take home from this? Is I'm coming to this. Is a, okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm coming to okay, this. Okay, okay, okay. So prolonged history seen in infancy cannot be Cox, right? Doubtful labs, limitation. This is very interesting. Limitation of gene ex uh, expert ultra. See, the gene expert that we do is a PCR based uh, kind of a uh, test wherein you are taking those genomic segments to recognize the Cox bacilli. Now, the one which was done previously, gene expert, its sensitivity was it would pick up Cox when the bacterial load is about 131 bacteria per millimeter cube. And then the most sensitive was culture, which was if there are 50 bacteria per millimeter cube or more than that, it will pick up. But the newer modality of gene expert ultra, it is as sensitive as picking up 16 bacteria per millimeter cube. So almost 10 times more than the routine gene expert. Now, every increased sensitivity comes with poor specificity. So you'll have a lot of false positive. So if you are picking up specially from a bronchial level of watch, those who are, we have read those gene expert reports, there are heavy load, moderate and very low, those kind of things. So if you happen to send a ball sample and you get very low, then this is likely to be false positive and you may disregard it if the history is not classical. But same very low you get in CSF, very low you get in maybe pericardial fluid or some internal fluids or from even the back, from the lymph node or from tissue then that is to be taken as positive. But in case of bronchial lavage, where there may be dormant bacilli, which are not actually pathogenic, there it has to be neglected. That's the difference. So that's a take home. Read the gene expert carefully. Persistent shadow and complaints. Now, previous X-rays were showing the shadows which are progressively deteriorating. Then X-ray is showing air-filled eosophagus, which is a very important take home from this. And since this is coming from almost like early infantile age group, going on for two weeks with the exacerbation, think of aspiration syndromes, and then with collecting all the features together, you may be hitting. Bacterial diagnosis is very important for Cox. I think the referring physician had rightly said he had mild positive, so he was not very sure, so he had sent it. So, Abba, answering your question, the whole history started is very too long to be Cox without treatment. Starting early infancy, with a recurrent respiratory infection, think of congenital anomaly, could be an aspiration syndrome, could be H-type fistula, could be aspirations of maybe GR or any kind of that. And then don't miss out on those shadows which are looking at you very blatantly. Of course, you did not miss it. All of us missed it. So that's the first thing. Mahesh. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, two things in this is if a lateral was taken, you would have picked it up. Uh, because esophagus is always a collapse structure. I totally agree with uh, Abba okay. that esophagus is always a collapse structure. And when you see an esophagus which is prominent, that is why when you see an esophagus that is prominent straight away, like somebody mentioned achalasia, so something behind the heart which is filled up, achalasia, a filled up esophagus, hiatus hernia, all these things come into play. So I think a lateral should be utilized because okay. it's not much of a radiation. I agree with you. Lateral has a utility. I'm not spacing on that. Uh, but because yes, esophagus is always be... collapsed. It has no air in it. No question. You never appreciate an esophagus. The moment you see air in the esophagus, you know there is a problem. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what Abba picked up is just amazing. Absolutely good. Just... So now, let's move to the second case. Now, this is... Uh, Dr. Ambedkar's clinic, uh, interpretation of history. I want to, one of you or maybe few of you to come on this history. 12-year girl brought for fever for 20 days, cough for 70 days, and respiratory distress for two days. How will you analyze this in this child? I want your analysis of these three symptoms with this time lag. Fever first or cough first? I'm sorry. Fever first or cough first? Bula, bula. I have started given, with fever. fever 20 days, cough 70 days. Are, I have given the Stop. numbers, uh, Jay. Ah, <coughs> fever for so 20 days, first. cough for 17 days. Obviously, fever started first. Three days later, okay. cough started. And the respiratory distress in last two days. Bionarchus indicates some low respect infection. This is very, I think, 
If it is a pneumonia, fever and cough starts at both at the same time. It started later. It's some if it's like a chronic infection, like a tuberculosis. Interpretation mm-hmm. like. Okay. Any other other thing? Fever for twenty days, uh-huh. which is the same fever which started twenty days back, yeah, yeah. or it is uh, increasing or improving or something like that. No, he's having remittent fever for last twenty days. Okay. And, and what about cough? Sick in last two days, he's become breathless. Obviously, become more sick. Okay. And what about cough? It is also increasing or it is same? Cough is the same again, but it is significant cough. So cough so again, first... we say it is like a our common analogy. It is a airway disease. What we say again, fever for twenty days. It is again a infective pathology. Respiratory distress since two days means something which is worsening pathology which we are hitting at. So, what kind of worsening pathology will come on the eighteenth day of fever? Like a patient having some airway infection develop. Endobronchial tuberculosis also one of the possible one can always think because cough is a predominant symptom. Mm-hmm. The patient developing complication like a pleural effusion, some empyema. Or maybe myocarditis later in later stage. Jai, commonly, are you considering some bacterial infection in this child? No, mm, some infection. Not oh, some. Means which some infection? Because which of those empyema will come after 18 days to fill up the pleura? You have seen so many empyema. When did they become presenting with a breathlessness on uh, in the third week? Usually, mm. empyema will fill up within five to seven days. Is there any so history of hemoptysis? No stuff in my face. Any other uh, system in whole, other than this respiratory? No, these like are it... the three symptoms, and these are the three symptoms he came with. Probably okay. tuberculosis, enlarged lymph node, pressing over bronchus, or something like that. That's a good guess. And leading to respiratory distress. Now you meant to say it was pressing on the bronchus, and then went on pressing to become distressed. Now why it should happen suddenly in two days? If it is progressive, then it would manifest subacutely, right? It would manifest because the fact that it started coughing so early, since then it has started compressing, and then suddenly within the last two days became breathless. I mean, uh, I have taken this case in one of the like this is the kind of cases we discuss in science PG clinic. So I thought it's a good uh, case to analyze. So uh, how, how perhaps Dr. Amrekar sir would take it fever twenty days. Is infection or inflammation going beyond two weeks more likely inflammation than infection? Though the non-localizing like cox or rare brucella and those things can present as an infective, but most of the times it will be non-infective inflammatory. Now with that, if the cuff is going on for last seventeen days and cuff being coming from airway, so there is some airway disease also coming at us. So whatever inflammation or infection is associated with a airway irritation. Now what kind of airway irritation? Had it been a airway disease, progressive would have given some symptom. Had it been upper airway, would have given to strider. Had it been small airway, would have given to wheeze. But <coughs> none of them is coming. It's just the irritation of the airway. So there is some irritation of the airway. Perhaps extra luminal I may consider, as Dr. Dabarkar said, whether it's a lymph node compressing on the airway, and that inflammation is causing it. Now coming to third symptom, respiratory distress coming after three weeks. Now which of those infections? Will come after three weeks. Is this cox which will fill up after three weeks? That's possible. So same lymph node, and then you have got a reactive richest focus breaking into the pleura and giving rise to sudden appearance of respiratory distress. Now respiratory distress coming suddenly, you also have to give the anatomy of that. Whether it is coming from upper airway, small airway, or alveolus. Had it been upper airway, strider would have come. This child don't have it. Small airway wheeze would have come. This child don't have it. Grunt would have been the alveolar. This child don't have it. So probably it's a pleura, sudden filling of the pleura. So here is a probably some compressive pathology, inflammatory pathology, maybe infective on the trachea or the airway, and then pleura filling up subsequently. So I'll just move with this case. This fever, infective, non-infective fever, more than two weeks, infection less likely except subacute or chronic fevers like TB. Cough is a predominant complaint. Airway disease in the lumen, in the wall, or outside as a compression. It's not with any abnormal mechanics. Only cough without mechanics. So probably it's irritation of the airway. 
it's <coughs> like a fixed pathology. That's very interesting. If a fixed pathology, it won't give rise to cough. Like a foreign body which is stuck in the airway won't give rise to cough. So something which is progressing and causing irritation more. Prolonged fever with cough, differential diagnosis, inflammation of the airway, infective inflammatory mass compressing the airway. Not a foreign body as it started with fever and cough later. So somebody said foreign body is less likely because it started with fever and cough them later. Third complaint, respiratory distress appearing after three weeks. This is unlikely to be or least likely to be a bacterial infection. Had it been a bacterial infection, you would have come up with that empyema within first week, end of the first week. Any new complaint after seven to ten days of first complaint is less likely to be part of the primary pathology or its complication. Example, empyema, which would come by fifth or seventh day. So the complaint which will appear after second week could be immunological complication, could be a mechanical or it could be totally unrelated different pathology. Sudden respiratory distress, as I said, had it been from alveolar pathology, would have given the rest to grunt. Airway pathology, wheeze, pleural pathology could have been. Uh, uh, pleural pathology would not give any of those things. So that brings you to pleura. We are still discussing only on the history. We are not touched the patient. And if it is hyperacute, it is pneumothorax. If it is acute, it's a fluid. So probably some pleural fluid pathology with upper airway compression. We are perhaps making a jargon like undergraduate or postgraduate, but that's how we do it. I think this was just kind of a feeling I wanted to give how the SAN postgraduate clinic goes. When this child, initial history suggests of inflammatory disease with airway irritation without significant obstruction. Airway disease to come with respiratory distress will have wheeze or stridor. This child don't have such, so distress is not because of airway disease directly. Sudden respiratory distress due to alveolar disease will have hypoxia and grunt. And in this setting, there is no sign of hypoxia, significant hypoxia. So alveolar disease going to respiratory distress will be usually subacute with slow progressive tachypnea. So had it been a pneumonia progressive, then when this flows progressive tachypnea getting into distress, here it's a sudden. So we are summarizing it to the plural pathology, probably fluid. So for coming to the last sentence, non-infective inflammation with airway irritation, is it malignancy? So first possibility, as Dr. Dabadkar said, whether it is uh, lymph node which is compressing the airway, we have seen that kind of a pathology in the past, and suddenly a uh, pleura filling up as a Cox response. It can be Cox is the first differential diagnosis. And second, not to forget, a possibility of a malignancy. A lymph node in the mediastinum compressing the airway, progressively increasing, and then same malignant pathology filling up the pleura. We have seen about three or four cases like this in Wadi and last one year. This is one of them I had picked up to present. And this was his X-ray. If you could see the pleura being completely full. The first X-ray which he had shown was clear, which was actually this child had come from Nashik. And first X-ray was only slight mediastinal widening. And this was X-ray taken two weeks, uh, just two or three days ago with a complete pleura. And this was his CT scan, which was showing a malignant pathology with a pleura filling, and it was in the mediastinal. So this was a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I just, this case was taken just to kind of give a, uh, I would say, clinical uh, discussion on the presentation. So you have a fever to start with and cough. This is not aspiration. Cough coming up later, this is not aspiration. As somebody said cough and fever would have started same time in case of pneumonia. Classical pneumonia, which is the alveolar disease, Cough usually starts after two to three days. We have seen, we have seen so many cases we came with only high grade fever till day three, day four, and count, strong bacterial counts. We happen to take as a screen a chest X-ray and a large lower consolidation without any cough. So classical pneumonia is high grade fever and second, third day cough. And if it gets complicated, fourth or fifth day sudden become breathless because of empyema. That's a typical pneumonia getting into empyema. We get upfront. Cough with fever, then it could you could be dealing with atypical infection like mycoplasma or occasional chlamydia. This child fever started first, cough came later. So this is not aspiration. This is not primary straight away. This is some inflammation infection, which later on had a airway compression or airway irritability. Anybody want to make any comment on this, or I'll move to the next case, if the time permit. This is very interesting. Third one. But before but that, I will think of any malignancy with history of only 18 days. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially non Hodgkin's progress. Only 18 days. Yes, yes. There must be some, some history to start with. Uh, Dr. Dabadkar, sir, uh, when the fever goes beyond two weeks, 
I am drifting away from infection and I am going to inflammation or malignancy more. So fever in the third week to me is connective tissue or a malignancy. Sir, I have one question. Infection here. like Cox will be my definitely close differential, but Cox. will be almost equivalent to that. Yeah. Sir, yeah, I have sir. one question here. Yes. The patient is presenting with fever after 20 days or something like that, or in between somebody is seeing fever with Cox. So do one goes away with X-ray chest one at least one X-ray chest, and do we see such type of findings on X-ray chest? Which finding? Yes, of course I showed you the X-ray. No, so nantar da tumi the empire. Ah, adi ta X-ray me budam load kela nae. Yacha bade fakta slight medias channel widening hota ba. Baki kai na. Okay. That fakta that plura pehe plura ta nantar the. Right. Any questions? Any other comments? Else I will move to the third very interesting thing. This is a fifth month boy, five months old boy, full term normal. Yeah, actually, uh, answering to your question, Dr. Dabadkar, sir, fever in the third week. The NTP guideline says fever more than 15 days, cup more than 15 days, and loss of weight in last three months more than 5%. These are the first screen symptoms to suspect cox. 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 Right? cox. So, this child, I'm sure. If somebody comes within first, I'll be definitely investigating for COX. That's the reason I gave my two clinical differential. One is COX and second is malignancy. So take home message, though 18 days, one should think of malignancy also. And yes. second thing, CT scan is more diagnostic. And CT scan should be done as early as possible. Or is even it? at least, first you make your before, differential. Before, before going for any investigation, one should know to what we are going to... And what like we are looking for. Have your differential yeah, diagnosis. Clinic, clinically, one should suspect that there could be malignancy may be seen. And then a CT scan comes with malignancy, then that's the right way. Perfect. Third case is a five months boy, full term normal delivery, third degree consanguinity. Normal till one month ago. So till four months, his child was all right. He was brought to primary pediatrician for cuff three days with a low fever and breathing difficulty for one day. The pediatrician noticed respiratory infection, but baby also had some hepatitis fleas. Notes mentioned that spleen is 2 centimeter, liver is 2 centimeter, 3 centimeter. The child was advised to be hospitalized, but parent refused and took OPD treatment. And child got better in four days. He was all right for next three weeks, but he had feeding difficulty and poor suck following that. So now again brought to the pediatrician, but now he was sick, so was sent to the center. So now he's brought for severe dyspnea since two days, mild cough, fever for four days. So the pediatrician referred further for the further management. Now somebody wants to take up here. Any any comments at this history point? Any leads here, or I will move further. Aba Aika, Sunya. Sir, sir, cough. Aye, sir. 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 Aye, Backbenchers can talk, no? Ha, come Backbenchers. on. Ah, Mala sir, ki hepatitis plena megali tumi je mention karte it carries definitely some meaning. I yes, know. yes. Parabat. Otherwise, yes. Ha, tumcha conference ano ho gana? Sirata the order sirai le sirata kai kasla alone kasla kai. Okay, I'll move further. There is no significant perinatal history, no major illness in the first four months, no significant family history. On examination, is tachycardic, capillary fill is okay, saturation is 84% at room. He is alert and irritable. irritable. He is pale, tachypneic, all kind of retractions are there. Liver is 4 centimeters, spleen is 5 centimeters, rest otherwise is all right. So, any comment at this point of time? Yes, sir. Hello. 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 Hello.
Oh. Decompensation, what we can see. Oh. Due to infection or whatever. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so probably you're talking about cardiac failure, yeah? Cardiac failure, yeah. Okay. Basically, but the reason is anemia. Okay. He had a significant anemia. Yeah. This congestive cardiac failure, severe anemia, organomegaly. Okay. So he was given oxygen, the NRM mask, samples collected. So he presented as a respiratory emergency. That's the reason I have taken you here. Samples collected for his routines in ICU. He was given IV furosemide. X-ray chest was taken. And X-ray was the comments. Anything significant you feel? Costochondral bleeding is there. Yeah. It is very much obvious. Okay. okay. There is. Uh... <laughs> Rizal, you are not supposed to comment. I know. <laughs> you are not supposed <laughs> to comment. <laughs> you are not supposed Normal to. Normal bone shadows are there. Huh? Abnormal bone shadows, some osteo. I will move further. You will get some more clues. So his reports, his hemoglobin is 6.6. .6. His total count is 40,500. Lymphocyte 40%, monocyte 10%. His platelet is 60,000. He has got blast 8%. Myelocyte 6%, metamyelocyte 15%, normal blast 15%. LFT, KFT normal. Calcium 6.8. <laughs> he either is laughing. Phosphate is 3.6 and alkaline phosphate is 8.06. Now, what is your comment on this? Savadakar, sir, you have a chan comment. But you have to say that with Pelar and with this picture, can we think of some uh, uh, leukemia or something like that? Yes. It was thought like leukemia only because blast cells are there. Yes. 8% yes. blast. Yes. Okay. So the resident on duty or the consultant duty, since this kind of a count, there is always a risk of tumor lysis syndrome. So they started working on that line and he was given hyperhydration. With that hyperhydration, child collapsed. It developed fluor overload, Hello. cardiac failure, Hello. had to be intubated, ventilated, high frequency, and stabilized in the next four days. Now, bone marrow was done, and there were no blasts in the bone marrow. His LDH was normal, uric acid was normal. Now, what is it? So nutritional issues, anemia. So, I will just summarize the whole see, case. All, ah, bola, bola, bola. Sir, all three cell lines are affected. Yes. Along with that, there is a hepatosplenomegaly. Oh. So, some kind of inflammatory disorder, like maybe a histiocytosis or something. Okay, but bone marrow would have picked up Sunil. Okay. Bhaita, sir. Or yes. sir, alkaline phosphate is 80 or something. Yeah, yeah. Bhaita, sir. Bhaita, sir. Ab, bol, bol, bol. Is, it, is it a rickets? Yeah, yeah. Because he's got hypocalcemia, he's got oligemic, oligemic feeds, he's getting fluid overload and CCF. Yes. So there is some cardiac anomalies with hypocalcemia. In this stage, we can think of Gijor syndrome like syndrome where we can get hypocalcemia very commonly and along with that the child get get some i would say kind of a mental anomaly where they said they can go into failures i will just i will just summarize all the positive thing that we got child presents at four months of age with a severe anemia so much so that he gets into cardiac failure hepatosplenomegaly all three cell lines affected but they are not cytopenia rather they are cytosis so you got a leukocytosis of forty thousand with 8% blast, right? Now, which is that condition in which you get peripheral smear with blast, but bone marrow not showing any blast. So this is definitely not rickets with that point of view. Pratish, do you agree with that? Blast huh? Like uh, anything which causes the uh, high overload of RBCs. Ah, nice, nice, nice. Then they would have seen, we wouldn't have seen the anemia. Now, what Dr. Dabadkar said is again, see, Richrider, you must have realized we have got fantastic pediatricians here. First was cracked by Abba, second is cracked by Dr. Dabadkar. He rightly said that there is some abnormal bone seen. Now, for comparison, I have kept a normal X-ray, some other child's X-ray, 
Now compare the bones of the pig. This is marble bone disease. This is osteopetrosis. 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 Okay, this is bone in bone. You can see the thickness of the bones. You can see all the whatever is seen. So bone in bone. This is basically bony overgrowth infiltration into the marrow, and the marrow contents are pushed out into circulation. So there are no blast. Actually, those are blast which are coming from marrow outside. And in fact, the last week only we had a, a Jupiter people presenting in Science PG Clinic uh, a case of osteo. So this is infantile malignant osteopetrosis, which will come with severe anemia, bone marrow content pushed out, and other other cell lines. So your liver and spleen is kind of hypertrophied because of uh, erythropoiesis happening there, and they become severely anemic because there is no production of uh, hemoglobin. And uh, whatever extra cells you are seeing, WBC and all, they are actually pushed out of bone marrow, and they are all immature cell lines, which are normally supposed to be inside the bone marrow, but they are out because there is no space left in the bone marrow. So this is osteopetrosis, which is coming with severe anemia and cardiac failure at the presentation. If you notice, there is severe hypocalcemia also, which is also associated feature of this. In fact, few of the do this child had costochondral bleeding? Not really, Abba. Not really. Yeah, because what I would say, he, if this X-ray on the left side is ah. showing a very classical of costochondral bleeding. Uh, We're talking uh, about bleeding. So in a patient who is having a, a, a picture like a costochondral bleeding, ah. but again a bone which are filled bones, what we can ah. call bone in bone, then ah. it would take us away from uh, hypocalcemia, so basically vitamin D decades to osteopetrosis. That would be the taken from my side. Only looking at the whole picture, yes, rickets can have severe hypocalcemia to give rise to cardiac failure, but not with such a severe uh, anemia. One, if, if I would say this X-ray, I have seen so many X-rays of rickets with costochondral bleeding having such type of prominent anterior ends, but yeah. this bone in bone, or you can say white bones ribs, yeah, that is yeah. a feature which can differentiating from uh, the common basically hypocalcemia. Rickets we get little more of a. Uh, osteoporosis rather than here what we are seeing yeah, right. uh, more yeah. of a uh, hyperlucent shadow. See, when you see a standalone x-ray you are likely to miss it but when you compare yeah. it with the other x-ray you suddenly get the difference between the two kind of bones you know compare this normal rib with this is bone but, in bone but still, still on the left side x-ray is quite um, uh, diagnostic actually one diagnostic. can say absolutely. Yeah. absolutely yeah one has to see only key the bones are filled so it's a marble bone disease, infantile malignant osteopetrosis, bone marrow infiltrated by increasing bone marrow, matter leading to progressive pancytopenia, organomegaly, cranial no compression. That's all you can get this information. Uh, do we have time at all or we should stop? One more case, sir. Okay, there are one or two clippets which we can miss. So, so this is kind of a small slip. Three-year-old child, recurrent respiratory infection since one year of age, year discharge in six months, Admitted twice, examination, 3 years, 10.2 kg, 82 centimeters, is pale, respiration slightly high, saturation is borderline, scattered crepts, some interesting findings on auscultation, which perhaps was missed so far. This was his X-ray. And this X-ray just taken two months ago. So, any text? Something which is again a very, I mean, it's not, I would say, mistake, but commonly basics are overlooked and then you can fall into trouble. This is collapse? Yeah, there is a collapse, but is it explaining the underlying pathology is having recurrent infection for last three years since early child? Mucociliary disorder, ear discharge along with. Yes, perfect, perfect, likely. So, what are the findings which was missed on auscultation? Maybe dextrocardia. Absolutely, Sunia. You are spot on. <laughs> because if you see this X-ray, there is no right-left uh, mark on this. And this X-ray was moving from place to place and everybody is saying this. So, we just repeated an X-ray and my radiologist technician came running. Sir, I said I was expecting this only. So, this was a dextrocardia and they investigated it was Cartagena's syndrome. So simple clinical mistakes can take you all the way. This is three years old child seen so many times previously. Maybe I will give you one more case. Three year child sent by pediatrician for chest discomfort. Uh, mild cuff since last two days. 
clinically stable child. X-ray was taken, found some abnormality, so was sent to me. So it's a chest discomfort he came for with mild cough since last two days. Okay. Otherwise, he was absolutely all right, child. But parent came running because the X-ray was showing. I don't know why. First of all, the X-ray was taken on this child. Why X-ray was taken? But he was sent to us. So, Doctor Damarkar, sir, you are right. So, this was a foreign body. Okay. So, we were doubtful. A concha screw, kider khaliya. So, then we took a lateral X-ray for Sridhar. And Sridhar, here is the X-ray. It is exactly wow. right. So, where is the foreign body? Karayana, right? But we put a scope, and there was no foreign body. Huh. Okay. So where is it? It is here. X-ray film. Now, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was in the esophagus, in the previous plate, which was taken six hours prior to bronchoscopy, and a scope was done. By that time, it had gone down. <laughs> so moral of the trick was <coughs> before doing any previous, therapeutic scope for a foreign body. Take a X-ray just before the procedure. The previous X-ray. See both the X-rays. Anybody can see. No, no, no. Ah, bus, bus. See the first one. See the second one. You can't have better X-ray than this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. Very good quality. Yeah, and take it. I mean, you can't have better X-ray than this. And the scope was put, and we were baffled. Where did he get a foreign body? To close the scope, nikal ke opus X-ray dekha paint pe hai. So it was actually a sufficient foreign body. So moral of the story: Before putting a therapeutic scope, take the X-ray just before the procedure. Very important. I think we'll stop Again. here. We'll stop here, right? Hey, Mayesh, you should have had your session first. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> Excellent <laughs> collection. Okay. And everybody was active even in the middle of the night. Yeah, that's something. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Lovely okay. collection. And Both. I'm always enamored with Abba Sahib. He's phenomenal. Arre, arre, thank you, sir. <laughs> I, I see all your uh, comments on the group also. Very okay, good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. sir. Raigad, we have fantastic <laughs> group. <laughs> Raigad is full <laughs> of it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much yeah. for the uh, presentation, sir. It was very interesting. Both of you, Dr. Sridhar as well as Dr. Mahesh Mohite. Thank you so much, the attendees, for your patient listening and being there with us till 11. On a brighter side, it's Sunday tomorrow. So, you, you all can get up late. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so Thank much, you everyone. Much. Have a great Thank night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Sridhar. Bye. See you, Sridhar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.